So hello everyone, we're right on 11. I might just wait a little bit longer before we start. I can see people coming in. Just give it one or two minutes as the number of participants climbs, which is so lovely to see. It looks like Jackie's in. Excellent. I'm here, but I don't have a camera, sorry. Hello, Jackie. How are you? Hello. I'm Andrew. Hello, Andrew. Just wait a little minute longer as I can see the number of participants climbing. So welcome to Perspectives in Digital Health Recruitment. Um, I'm Andrew Bailey, Professor of Allied Health at Sydney Local Health District and Sydney University of Sydney. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to this Digital Health ECR community event, uh, so ably put together by Anna Jansen and her, her, her team of um, wonderful uh, people. Um, let me begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on the, of the land on which we're meeting. Um, and I'm on the, um, the Camaragal people of the, of the Great Eora Nation. Um, I'd like to uh, just uh, pay my respects to elders past, present and future, and perhaps invite the um, power members maybe to say whose land they're on um, just quickly before we start. Robin, would you like to say where you're at? Well, sorry, Robin, I think you're still on mute. Maybe while we, maybe just wait a little, maybe Stephanie, do you want to say where you're at? Hi, Andrew, I'm, um, I'm the people of the Jarug, um people. I'm calling in today from the University of Sydney at Westmead campus. Brilliant, thank you. And Rachel, would you like to say where you're at? Hi everyone, I'm also on the, the lands of the Darug people, um, working from home uh, from Western Sydney today. And Maddie, do you want to tell us where you're at? Uh, sure, I think I'm also the same. And Robin, would you like to say where you're at? Uh, can you hear me now, Andrew? I can indeed, thank uh, you, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, um, it's Robin Henshaw and I'm at Tea Gardens. I'm actually the um, consumer panellist and it's a bit remiss of me because I don't know what, uh, what native land I'm on here. I should do, but I don't. That's, and it's beautiful country there. I, I particularly love that. It, it is. It's absolutely gorgeous country. It's definitely the saltwater people. <laughs> Thank you. And, um, and Jackie. You're, you're just on audio, so uh, you're on audio land, but what, what, what land are you on? Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have a, a camera, um, but I'm also on the Dora People's Land. I'm at um, Blacktown Hospital today. Thank you, everybody. And I just, before we go on, just like to say that this is, always was and always will be an Aboriginal land. So this is a, a, a fantastic um, 
presentation or panel of, of speakers that we have organized today to talk about a really, really crucial topic for our research. Uh, and I guess I'd just like to point out, um, I suppose, two things. My impression of this is really that um, change is the only constant in the sense that uh, the digital world is evolving so, so quickly that recruitment in this space is such an amazing and interesting kind of challenge for us. Um, I, I, when I started um, some time ago, the, the sort of uh, the, the holy grail of recruitment for a lot of the work that I did was to get a story into the Women's Weekly. Because if you got a story in the Women's Weekly, what happened is that that went out into the world and it sat in waiting rooms. And people would sit in waiting rooms and read that story, and then they would get in contact with you to take part in your research. And it was just a fantastic way to do that. So we try to crack the article in the Women's Weekly. And of course, um, I don't even know if the Women's Weekly still runs. <laughs> I haven't seen one in a waiting room for a long time. <laughs> Maybe it's the waiting rooms that I'm in. But I think over the years, the way that we get to people has changed, and this is just a fantastic opportunity to share some of those sort of practical tips and tricks for how to do that. So could I, uh, before we go on to um, each of the panel members talking about their, their perspectives on this, could I ask um, the panel members to introduce themselves? Now I'd like to start with uh, Rachel Rejack. Yes. <laughs> like to give yep. us a rundown on on, on introducing yourself. Sure, yeah. So, hi everyone. My name is Rachel Redake um, and I'm a, a postdoctoral research fellow within the discipline of speech pathology and more specifically within the Acquired Brain Injury Communication Lab. So, our research um, really focuses on uh, understanding how communication might change after someone has an acquired brain injury and also on developing uh, ways to help improve communication after an acquired brain injury. So that's sort of the area of research that, um, yeah, that, that I'm involved with and have experience in terms of recruitment. And Robin, you, you gave us a bit of an introduction, but is there anything more that you'd like to say to introduce yourself? Yes, actually, I'm interested to hear you say about um, working through the Australian Women's Weekly. I worked in um, federal Commonwealth Department of Health back 23 years ago before I saw the light and moved out. Um, and in those days, we didn't have anything like we're doing today. It's quite, in, quite interesting. And I actually found the advertisement for the study that I participated in through um, one of the Sunday newspapers, which, um, brought my, brought, which piqued my interest because I was going to have to travel an hour each way to um, see a physio for the problems that I was having. So, my, so I'm Robin Henshaw, I live at Tea Gardens. Um, I'm the consumer panelist. Um, this is all new technology for, for me, which is why I logged in so early and poor Anna got me at about 10.30. Um, and I'm retired, uh, I'm 66 years of age and I had a um, problem with the knee and hip lower back problems and um, participated in the Empower Knee Management Study through Sydney Uni. Thank you, Robin. Ah, Stephanie, do you want to give us a rundown, an introduction? Um, hi everyone, my name's Stephanie Partridge. I'm a Senior Research Fellow in the School of Health Sciences at the University of Sydney. Um, my background um, is I'm a trained um, accredited practicing dietitian and my research um, focuses on really understanding um, adolescents' digital world and developing digital health programs um, and really coming from a primary um, prevention perspective. Um, and I also work with researchers who work with patients with, um, who have experienced chronic disease. So I guess there's quite a bit of a contrast there, trying to prevent diseases in young people and then working with people who have already experienced that. So, and I guess that's where my experience comes from, working across um, a few different population groups. Thanks, Stephanie. And Jackie, would you like to introduce yourselves, yourself? Sorry. Oh, hello, good morning. My name is Jackie. I'm um, the Stroke Clinical Nurse Consultant here at Blacktown Hospital. Um, I've been a nurse for almost 21 years, and the last sort of five years been focusing more within the um, area of stroke and stroke recovery. 
um, my experience of uh, research and a lot more so now is actually how to distribute the research findings, certainly within this um, digital era within we're in at the moment and also more more re real um, with the COVID last year as well, people not being able to attend um, conferences, etc. And um, the reduction in um, educational sessions, how to get all that, those findings across to my colleagues more on the practical on the floor um, areas. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. And I think uh, last of our panel members is Maddie, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Andrew. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Maddie Kinlay, and I'm actually a PhD student in the Faculty of Medicine and Health, um, and I'm doing a PhD in digital health. So I previously completed an undergraduate in psychology, um, and now my, P my project has been evaluating um, the transition from paper-based medication charts in hospitals to electronic medication charts. Um, in a local health district. So um, I'm specifically looking at new types of medication errors that have resulted from this transition. And so uh, one component of my project has involved uh, interviewing a range of stakeholders, but it's more from a clinical perspective. So um, that includes doctors, nurses, pharmacists, but also like health informatics teams, uh, clinical leads, um, uh, trainers so it's i guess my perspective is more from less from a uh, consumer perspective and more from i guess recruiting uh, healthcare workers so yeah that's me thank you everybody and i and i guess everybody can in the that are, is here in the webinar can now see what a fantastic panel we have in front of us to talk about this issue a whole range of really fantastic perspectives now i suppose a good starting place for our conversation will be how do you get those eyeballs at the beginning to, to sort of first be interested? And Robin's given us a bit of a, uh, a take on that from her experience. It was in the, it was in the Sunday newspaper, I think she said, and I just maybe throw to Robin and say, Robin, is there anything else about that first contact that made you, uh, uh, made you interested in getting involved in research? Well, yeah, I guess um, I'd been to the doctor because I'm a fairly keen, fairly keen to keep, as I'm getting older, keep, to keep fit. So um, I was getting to the stage where I could barely walk because my knees and hips were getting really sore. And um, I spotted that in the paper and put my name down. And it was a little while, I guess it was probably about six or eight weeks or maybe a little bit longer before I, um, was contacted to say that I'd been accepted into the study. And as I said, if, had I not um, um, been able to access the study digitally, I would have been travelling into Newcastle, which would have taken me an hour and a half each way, once or twice a week to see a physio. So it just, it made, just made a huge difference to be able to do, um, to, to access the, the study online and um, to be able to be shown the exercises that I needed to do and it's made a huge difference. I now run, cycle, swim, walk every day of the week. I do a, a fairly an hour or a good hour or more exercise. So from not being almost being not able to walk at all to being able to get back to, to good physical exercise has been fantastic. So and it wouldn't have happened probably if I hadn't have I probably would not have kept going to a physio an hour and a half away. It's just, you know, it's just too hard to do on a couple of times a weekly basis. So that's a that's such a fantastic account of you know, so many of the really good aspects of the kind of healthcare innovations that we're trying to test yeah. in our research. Um, I'm wondering, Rachel, if you want to, you've got some slides. Do you want to run with the beginning of and and, and take us through there? Sure. Um, I'll just get the slides up. So oh, I have. Have I, yeah. have I thrown you? Under no, the bus no. Too quickly. <laughs> All good. I'll just get those organised. Um, Yes, I have put together just a few slides to help share about our team um, and the sort of research that we do. So is that displaying okay at your end? Yes. Yep, excellent. Okay, so 
Um, as I mentioned, I do um, work as part of a, a team um, called the Acquired Brain Injury Communication Lab. Um, and this slide just sort of sets that in context that our, our lab director is Professor Leanne Tor, and we have a number of other early career researchers um, and HDR students within our team, as well as some external collaborators across other institutions. So uh, the sorts of participants that we include in our research are people who may have had a traumatic brain injury, so through something like a car accident, an assault or a fall, or who have other forms of acquired, uh, of acquired brain injury, such as a stroke, a brain tumour, for example. So just to give you some context about my experiences. So I completed my PhD um, in 2019 with a specific focus on using telehealth to work with people with traumatic brain injury. Um, for the two key studies for my PhD, the, the first study was a study around assessment and we did need to recruit 20 people with TBI and that particular recruitment phase took 18 months. And then for the second intervention study, we needed to recruit 36 people with TBI, which took us about three years. So the one fortunate factor in my favour in terms of recruitment was that I was a part-time PhD candidate, which did give me a, a bit of a longer timeline to, um, to, to cover off that recruitment. Um, but I, I guess I just share that to, um, to show that recruitment can be quite a long process. Um, we've now moved on with our team to a project, oops, sorry, going too fast, called the Social Brain Toolkit Project, where we're looking to develop an online suite of resources for people with any type of acquired brain injury. And one reason we've made that decision to broaden out to look at any type of acquired brain injury is that we sort of learnt our lesson from my PhD research and how long recruitment took for that particular project. Um, and so we're trying to, to, I guess, recruit with that broader focus now. And we're still in the recruitment phase, so it remains to be seen how successful we are um, with recruitment for this project. Um, I guess I wanted to share that I, um, reflecting on my PhD, I think recruitment was one of the most stressful parts and one of the biggest challenges of my PhD. Um, I think there's a lot of aspects of research that you feel perhaps that you have a bit more control over. You can plan your research, you can get your ethics approvals, and then once you've got your data, you're kind of in charge of progressing the analysis and the reporting. But in this middle phase of recruitment, it really is very much out of your control. Um, and that can be quite stressful, particularly when you have the pressure of your project timelines on your back. So I think I just wanted to get out the message that um, it is something that is really uh, important to uh, discuss with your research team, with your research supervisors and get support because it can be really quite challenging. And I'm really glad that we're having this discussion today and perhaps can learn from each other um, because it is a really difficult, um, a difficult part of doing research. Um, just to touch on a few of the specific challenges that we find with our population, um, and perhaps even though you might not work with people with brain injury, you may see some similar challenges here um, to your own populations that you do research with. When we're working with people with brain injury, we are um, dealing with cognitive impairments. So I guess we need to be mindful that the information we put in front of participants, we may need to adapt in terms of comprehension and helping them to process that information. There can be memory challenges, both in terms of perhaps remembering to follow up about a research study or remembering the research appointments that have been booked in. And motivation can be a factor too in terms of people perhaps maintaining their engagement with a research project that might go over several months. Um, so I guess another challenge for us is that it's relatively uncommon um, in terms of the context of other health conditions. And so we have needed to take quite a targeted approach in terms of partnering with brain injury services and brain injury support organisations who already have those connections with people with brain injury. I guess our population as well, um, particularly if it's um, a person with brain injury who might be in their, their first year or first couple of years uh, following their injury, they may be quite busy with other types of rehabilitation and may have quite limited time to um, want to sign up to, to engage in a research project. Uh, and the final issue with this population is that they may have issues with digital access in terms of perhaps not having devices, not having internet access, or perhaps lacking the technical or, or cognitive skills to interact with an online platform. So just to highlight a few of our approaches to recruitment that we've taken. So as I've mentioned, we've really needed to connect with 
um, the organisations that are already in the business of providing support to people with brain injury. So that may be New South Wales Health Brain Injury Services or um, clinician networks um, of, of clinicians who work in this field. Uh, also going through consumer organisations such as Brain Injury Australia and Synapse. Uh, one of the steps our team has taken is uh, to set up an ethically approved research registry where people who've had a, a brain injury and who'd like to be kept informed about research can sign up to that registry, which then gives us um, permission to then contact them with information about our future research studies. We also do do some of those broader, I guess, recruitment strategies, posting on Twitter, posting on Facebook, although we probably find that less successful than some of our more targeted um, approaches. And just a few um, quick thoughts, I guess, around consenting um, and managing that process around people who may have a communication disability. And I guess even though you, in your research, you may not be specifically targeting this population, we would say that it's really valuable to consider how you might include the perspectives of people with different types of communication disability in your research. So one of the ways that we do that is to use easy English information and consent forms. And then um, in terms of following up that uh, information with the, the with the potential participant, we find it quite useful to do that via a Zoom call rather than just over email or even over the phone. Just the Zoom call gives you much more information about how the person's going with processing the information and making their decision. It also allows you screen sharing so that you can have the information statement up in front of them and highlight key parts. We do have an assessment of capacity for consent process that we do during that Zoom call, which I could talk in further detail if that would be of interest. And some of our um, consent forms, uh, we have had the requirement for a witness to sign off on the participant signature just as that additional safeguard. Um, so I'll finish up there, but I thought that just gives you an overview of some of the work that we've been doing around this space of recruitment and consent um, in digital health research. Thank you, Rachel, for getting us started there. And I wonder if anybody wants to jump in and make any comment or bounce off any of the points that Rachel made there. Um, I might just jump in quickly. I was just going to say, um, I think that you made a point that when you started out, uh, you, you know, recruitment takes time. And I think that if there's anything I've learned in my PhD, it's that these things do take time and they definitely take longer than what I guess you initially think they will. You know, you say, I'm going to recruit 50 people in six months and that kind of thing. And then you start to recruit and realize that, 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 you know, people are busy and that's, I guess, something that um, is definitely worth knowing when you're starting out to be aware that you need to be flexible with timing. You need to understand that people have a lot of other commitments and that you're, they're doing, they're helping you out and you need to be aware of that, I guess. So yeah, that's really interesting. No, I definitely agree with Maddie. I think that's a really, a really important point. And I've been more so thinking about this is when it is challenging, I'm like, am I, what I'm asking people to do, is that what they want to do? Have I, is the, is the program that I've developed and, you know, I have had input from young people in developing my programs, but is it what they want? And is that the reason that recruitment is so slow? Um, because it is not interested in, in what we've put together. Um, so really trying, yeah, going back to then to thinking about what I'm asking people to do and yeah, and looking at as opposed to recruitment being the issue, is it is it the program or what we're trying to get them to do? Is that the is that the issue? Um, it's something that I've been really grappling with lately, especially working with young people who haven't experienced a uh, you know a major life event like a traumatic brain injury, or um, like a knee injury like Robin had had. Um, so yeah, trying to really understand how we can engage them better. Maybe could we just get a a, a view from from Jackie about recruiting health professionals. Sorry about the delay. I'm just, I'm actually <laughs> trying to help my colleagues on the floor as well. Um, oh, brilliant. It's so good that you- it, I'm multitasking. I mean, that, you're multitasking. That sounds like the health professional that we need to get into a study. So that's, <laughs> you're exactly, you're exactly the- 
I think um, from a recruitment point of view, certainly if you're recruiting other health professionals, I think one of the, um, for me personally, if it's a point of interest that I'm really passionate about, then obviously I'm going to jump in straight away. And I think it makes it really harder if you're trying to get a perspective from different areas of, of health professionals just to get that overview even if they're not directly involved in that area that you're researching it's very hard to get them as enthused because obviously we all have time constraints you know we have our other demands as well so sometimes it can be really difficult to get them to engage because everybody's so busy um how you overcome that can be really that can be really challenging because a lot of it can just be personality um really as well to engage it's a difficult one to to answer but certainly for me i think if you can look at the topic you're researching and focus on the people that are directly involved you'll get certainly get a much better um, participation response and enthusiasm so we've, we've got a bit of a discussion going so far about how do you get those first eyeballs on there? How do you get that initial interest? Uh, and I think one of the really important points for me is that it's in a sense, it's not just what the person is interested to do, but what is competing for their time. And I, one of the things I've struggled with, um, with some e-therapy interventions is by making things much more accessible, <laughs> we're also competing with um, everything else, internet shopping, anything else the person could be doing sitting on the bus when they might be participating in our study. Uh, and I'm kind of aware that when we, you know, I had an interesting comment um, about a consort flow chart that I put in a paper, or one of my colleagues put in the paper, I was just lucky, lucky to be included in the, in the journey. Uh, where the, where the reviewer said, oh, this shows you how crappy e-therapies e are. And actually it was the other way around. You know, we would have never found those people who had an interest at the beginning be, uh, in order to know that they were interested if they had to fight their way through the health system to get to us. Uh, and I think that's a, a really crucial point. We make things easier for people to get to, but we're then also competing with all the other things that are on for them. Now, I'm just wondering, um, if, if anyone else has got points here that they want to raise about that sort of um, grabbing those first eyeballs. I think there was, a, Andrew, there was a question in the Q&A about, um, uh, was it on paid participation? And I know when I'm recruiting young people, the one of the first questions they always ask is, is this paid? Um, so we're learning that obviously their time is very valuable and that we're competing, especially on a, in a digital space with young people. Um, it's so hard to get their attention. So if there is an incentive or if there is um, some sort of, um, you know, dollar value to their time that we can give them for their time, that is being, working out to be more effective. Um, but then it's also working with ethics committees to make sure that that's not, um, you know, inappropriate, the amount that you need to offer them, but offering like uh, competitions and things like that have proved effective for us um, recently. Um, so I hope that answers that Q&A question. Thank you, Stephanie. Anyone else want to comment on the unpaid? Uh, so I guess I've had two different scenarios for our social brain toolkit project, um, because that is funded research through the iCare Foundation. We are able to, um, reimburse for, for time um, and sort of we've done that through through grocery vouchers at various time points because it is sort of a um, intervention study so sort of we get um, we provide participants with one voucher um, after the initial assessments and then one at the end of the study as well um, but we do keep in mind uh, quite carefully that ethics uh, question of um, not offering that as an inducement so in our initial advertising we don't actually mention that those um, vouchers are available, but it is then mentioned in the information statement that uh, participants would be considering. Um, in my PhD research, we didn't have any funding and so we didn't um, have that as a factor. Um, and I don't know, comparing the two scenarios, I don't know that we've had any more success because we've had the reimbursement available, but it's certainly something that we value being able to offer to participants in recognition of their, their contributions.
and I suppose um, maybe Jackie or Maddie, do you want to comment on the the role of payment or um, other sorts of reimbursement for health professionals? As a nurse, we like chocolate. You can never go wrong with a box of chocolate. Um, and I think also what would not necessarily um, an inducement to participate in a, a like as a gift or again chocolate I'll go back to chocolate again but I think knowing where because sometimes people will ask us to participate in um, research projects um, and we never tend to get or I, well this is just my personal experience of course and, and I'm the general research community but sometimes it's hard to know what the outcome on or you know what what did you participating you know research how did that make a difference and that's really what you want to you know when you look at participating in research you're doing it because you know this sort of altruistic you want to make a difference or feel that you're making a difference because it can make you feel very proud about participating and then that can lead on to being more willing to participate in future projects as well but definitely chocolate i think that's a really crucial point because I, I suppose one of the things that is coming up is how do we engage with our participants in a more meaningful and deeper way uh, and that and some of the ideas that we see from the consumer participation movement right back to the kind of through the 1960s, uh, we're really trying for a much deeper engagement. And I think uh, that has great promise. I, I, I could see in some of the things that Rachel was talking about that, that actually engaging with uh, uh, the stakeholders, the people who would take part in the study was a really important part of this. And, you know, we, some people have said no survey without service as a, as a sort of, uh, as a sort of motto for some of this, just to kind of close that loop, you know, the, and, and kind of not just take from the community when we do research, but also give back. Um, and maybe, maybe Robin, do you want to jump in there? I'm sorry, Robin, we've, we asked you to mute, but we've, you're still on mute. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yep. Um, well, I, I participated, I guess, purely from a selfish point of view and that I wanted to get something out of it that would help me in the long term with um, becoming healthier. So, um, and I was interested to listen to some of the comments because as an older participant in a study, um, I, I'm, st I am reasonably digitally, um, um, capable, but a lot of people my age probably aren't. Um, and to be quite honest, when Antonio rang and asked whether I'd like to participate in a Zoom meeting, I didn't actually have Zoom on, on any of my, on any of my, my, um, equipment so I had to work out how to download and I actually did manage to do that so uh, I know a lot of the researchers are working with younger populations but they're also working with populations my age and and we're not all we're not all tech savvy I know if it, if it had have been my husband that they'd asked he would have thrown up his hand and said no no I couldn't do it so um so I it, to me the, the there are I, I can understand the ch challenges that some of the researchers are having with um being able to get people to actually participate because a lot of people are not um, not digi digitally um, proficient. Um, but it, I actually found it quite good in that, um, you know, um, my exercises that um, Antonio put on were on Physio app. So I could see exactly what I needed to do and he would check, uh, he checked to start with that I was doing the exercises correctly um, when I first started, and every couple of weeks he would check to make sure. Um, and on getting people to continue to p participate, um, I used to get an email each week that I, from them to remind me of the meeting the following week 
and um, if they didn't hear back from me before the meeting, Antonio used to ring and say, just reminding you that your meeting's tomorrow. Um, That's brilliant, Robin. Thank you. So there, I guess that's also understanding that there are intrinsic motivations to participate. Hmm. In some ways, I suppose we could understand all this as really about the user experience and, and how do we make sure that the, the person we want in our study is actually getting something from it and it works for them. For them. Um, exactly right. That's, you know, it's, it's what, what people want to get out of it. I think, you know, if, if they don't really want to do the study, then they don't really, they won't really participate fully. So. And, and that might be the space where we need some external in, inducement or, in, or inducement's not the right word, uh, reimbursement. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We, I, I guess just to throw in a, 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 an interesting aside, we've had some interesting questions in the sort of work that I do in drug and alcohol about whether or not giving participants who taken part in studies about their drug and alcohol use, um, some form of reimbursement would mean that they would go and buy drugs or alcohol with that. <laughs> and of course we had gone back and said, well, you know, just like any member of the community can go and buy drugs or alcohol. Mm. <laughs> um, you know, why would we get some, so we, why would we have some paternalistic attitude about, about, about drug and alcohol use? So I, I think it's an, sometimes we can have interesting discussions with ethics about the sorts of things that are, are, um, become issues in, in, um, in, in reimbursement. Um, now I just wonder uh, if there are other room or oh, Maddie, you've got a comment, go for it. Oh yeah, sorry. I was just going to jump in and make kind of a sidestep to that, um, which is that I guess for my recruitment process, um, uh, because I am a student as well, I don't have the option to reimburse. And also I think just in healthcare, it's difficult to sort of do that for healthcare professionals. But what I was going to say is that I found there's a double-edged sword with um, what I do is I try and get the approval, I guess, of managers or of people who are higher up that can give me uh, participants' names or people they think would be really interested in my project. And so then I can contact them to participate. But with that, I guess, is kind of the opposite side that if they feel like their manager has put their name forward or that, you know, that's something that they um, should do for, for their job, um, that can also kind of change the motivation for why they're participating because they feel like they have to or they don't want they they feel like it would be uh it would it would make them um I guess appear good to their managers so that's I for me that's something that I've kind of come across is making sure that people know that they, they don't have to participate if they don't want to and it's only just getting approval not telling them they have to do the study So we're heading down a path of trying to understand the context of the recruitment and trying to understand the, the participants' experience. I just wonder, we've, we've kind of talked about those first eyeballs, that kind of um, some, the importance of chocolate. I think we can't really go into the modern era without talking about the importance of chocolate. But uh, I just wonder about anybody have a really, really creative or off the wall kind of recruitment strategy. I don't know if it's off the wall, but with young people, we have tried some TikTok, um, <laughs> which has been fun. Um, but again, we feel a bit, a bit like losers on them. <laughs> but um, we are starting our youth advisory group um, so we're for, our, for a new study. So we're really excited about what, um, what ideas they will bring um, to this, um, to the recruitment challenge. And um, I guess if it's coming from them, it won't look as, um, as bad as coming from us. Um, so yeah, for us, it's trying to yeah, adapt to all those new platforms that are available for young people uh, and just trying to um, work out ways to use them in a, an effective way. That sounds brilliant, Stephanie. I, I, I think the more um, old people can do daggy stuff, the more teenagers will really flock to do things. No. It illustrates the point, I think, about what we're competing against. And if we go into these, these, in a sense, these, these, mar I guess we could say marketplaces where we're competing, maybe that's a bit commercial, but 
you know, that we, we actually have to do a pretty impressive job of it in order to bring people in. <laughs> yeah. Unless that's the sort of, a, a, you know, the, the daggy dad joke um, style of, of recruitment. I'm, perhaps I can carry that off. <laughs> any, any further comments there? Uh, I'm not sure if this um, really answers the question in terms of a creative approach to recruitment, but I guess um, some examples that come to mind are more creative approaches to study design that minimise recruitment. Um, so I guess as one example, we had an honours student a few years ago who was interested in looking um, at a comparison between how experienced speech pathologists uh, interacted with a person with TBI compared to student speech pathologists interacting with a person with TBI. So, our initial idea was that we had to recruit the students and the speech pathologists and the people with TBI, but then um, someone in the team had the idea to use um, actors to simulate patients with TBI. Um, and so we trained them how to portray a person with TBI and then um, that kind of cut out one of our uh, sort of needs for recruitment in terms of then the students and the speech pathologists could then have those interactions, but with a simulated patient rather than with a research participant. So I guess that's an example of maybe thinking a little bit outside the box and reducing your need uh, for recruitment. Another example of that um, for my PhD study, our initial plan was for a three arm um, control trial where we had a telehealth arm, an in-person arm and a control group. Um, but then we had the idea of using a historical control group. And so we didn't need to recruit those control participants again, because we could use data um, from a previous study within our team. So I guess just maybe when you're thinking about designing your study or how you're gonna answer your research questions, think about if there's any ways that you can minimize how many participants you need to recruit and still sort of address those research questions. And, and well, we sort of mentioned TikTok, and I guess there's been a question out there about Facebook ads. Uh, using Facebook ads for recruitment. Um, would anyone like to jump in and say anything about that? Uh, we've, in our research group, we had experience um, last year, uh, Anna Singleton um, and Rebecca Rayside and Julie Redfern, we created a program uh, for breast cancer survivors and for people with COPD who didn't have access to health services uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and we used paid advertising on Facebook to be able to recruit those two um, population groups. And we found that to be really effective. So I think we recruited nearly 800 people, I think, um, using those strategies, because a lot of those people are already engaged. Um, they're uh, a bit of a, a older population group and they're engaged on Facebook as their primary social media platform and they're often involved in um, maybe groups and things like that so they're easy to target using the Facebook um, algorithms for paid advertising where you can select those key features um, that you want to target uh, and we found um, we didn't have to I think it was around a few dollars per person to be able to recruit them and that worked um, really well and we had a streamlined onboarding system so we didn't have any you know verbal consent it was all digital digital consent uh, and a very smooth process for participants to be able to onboard to the study um, which i think made a difference um, and we were able to we captured all of the data that we um, use for recruitment so the number of ads the costs the dates that we put them up so we'll be able to uh, analyze all that data and also publish it so hopefully help with other studies because i think a lot of this recruitment data isn't captured and isn't isn't um, captured in the research uh, environment and it's not published um, so we can't really sort of learn from it and hearing from Robin's experiences and things like that is so important to be able to you know understand how easy that was for her to join that study so we need more data uh, like that. That has really great resonance for me Stephanie because we've I mean from a from an epidemiological perspective I've relied on some some big national surveys that recently had 60% response rate and where that's done with serious government backing and lots and lots of resources. And we've used Facebook ads uh, and some of those big uh, uh, social media kind of platforms to get large samples and reviewers response has often been, well, this is not very representative. <laughs> and of course the question is how representative it is, but then, we're in a space where if the 
biggest, best pieces of epidemiology with lots of resources can only get 60 or 70% response. You know, what's our standard here? Let's be, let's have a, a more, a deeper, um, a deeper argument about or deeper discussion about what this means. Um, now, I, just one thing that I, perhaps a, uh, that was a comment more than a question, but I just noticed that there are some questions coming through in the chat. We really want the questions in the Q&A if we could. Now, I do see the question that's in the chat is worth answering, and maybe, Rachel, you're in a good point to, place to answer it, or, or and perhaps anyone else is, that really about um, capacity to consent. Um, so maybe I should just read the question out, because we've been focusing on the... Um, so uh, the question from Catherine is, can we have some further information on assessment of capacity for consent? Yeah, so um, I'm happy to, to speak to that. And I've got a reference um, for the tool that we use, which I could share in the chat perhaps. So it's the University of California assessment of capacity for consent. And the way that works is that I, as the researcher, explain the study um, to the potential participant. And then I would say something like, okay, I just want to check that I've explained this clearly, um, rather than checking that you have consent. So, you know, it's sort of more that check, have I actually given the information um, that you need? Um, and then there's a series of questions that you, you go through in quite a structured way, asking things like, so can you tell me what are some of the things I'll be asking you to do in the study? What are some of the benefits? What are some of the risks? And if the person can't answer that question, that's okay. You just go back to the information statement and explain that again and, and then sort of ask the question again to, to see sort of with that support whether the person is showing that they've got comprehension of the information and, and that they are willing to proceed. Um, so I found that really helpful for me, even just as a researcher, to, to uh, feel reassured that the person does know what they're signing up for, that they aren't going in blind because you are getting them to kind of repeat back the information that you've shared with them so that you can be confident that they are making an informed decision to go ahead with the study. So I'll, I'll find the reference for the tool that we use and I might put that in the chat so that that's something people could follow up on. Thank you, Rachel. Any, any other comments about capacity to consent? Um, I guess for some of the research with younger people that I do, it's been quite low risk in terms of asking questions about where they where they access health information for nutrition and physical activity. And I've been able to work with the ethics committee to demonstrate that um, for even um, as young as 13 years, we don't need parental consent, considering that these young people already are um, have permission essentially permission from their parents to be on social media maybe they don't um, but they have that maturity level that they're on there and they're obviously seeing other things as well so can we also be on there and um, they can um, and there are some evidence that has been published which shows that young people are able to make an informed consent uh, a for, informed decision about a low risk intervent a low risk survey study or something along those lines so um, sort of we've been working with the ethics committee in order to, you know, be, before we start all these digital studies now um, and getting them on board with um, what we were thinking with and what their concerns are and being able to address that before we begin the study. So just to, just to sort of comment on process, we've got some really good questions coming through, which we want to get to quickly. But I suppose one thing that's on my mind is what is the biggest turn off? <laughs> Yeah. And maybe Robin or Jackie, you want to tell us what would really stop you from participating? What should we avoid? Do you want to go first, Robin? I'm just trying to think. I'm not sure whether there would be anything really if it was to my advantage. If I was going to get something out of it health wise, then um, I, you know, I wouldn't, I don't think I'd need an incentive if, if it's something that will improve my health and help me live longer. Um, then there's probably nothing that would really turn me off um, unless things got a little bit too complicated digitally. Um, you know, then, then, yeah, no, I don't see that there'd be anything really. I'm, I'm always happy to participate in anything that if it helps me, but also if it helps others in the community who are suffering the same issues or have the same issues. So. Thank you. And that really de demonstrates the value of a, a good connection with with, with passionate and keen uh, people in the community. Community, yeah. yeah. 
Um, I, I Jack- agree with Robin. Sorry, my my enthusiasm or willingness to participate in research, similarly the same reasons. Whether or not you know what can I get out of it mostly, and in the health area of health is mostly what can I get out of it for my patients. How do my people or my colleagues benefit from it? So that's definitely a huge incentive for me to participate. Thanks, Jackie. Um, now, I guess let's let's go on and answer some of the questions that we've got out there. We've got an interesting one um, from, I'm just trying to work out which channel I'm going to pay attention to. Um, Oh, where's it gone? It's a it's a question about a study being derailed by research by by uh, by by fraudulent. Um, I, I just lost it on the screen. Damn it! <laughs> I think it's in Damn the it. answered question box. And yes, okay. So uh, this is a question from right from Rachel Thompson who asked. Uh, about a study that she was involved in, in which uh, the study was completely derailed by enrollment fraud. So people who did not meet the eligibility criteria are trying to participate. And I presume that might be because there was an incentive to participate. Uh, and I just wonder if anyone has experience in that kind of space that they want to comment on. I can only comment on that from the experience of really early on in the process when people were using, uh, when people were using sort of keywords to draw people to websites and then kind of, in a sense, getting the wrong people because they'd cast their, their sort of keywords to draw people in with search engines. So they tried to play the search engine um, um, game with, with either the meta, meta um, data um, and and uh, um, in that instance, it was a question of trying to make sure that your that your refunneling in was good. Um, I do know that you know you do get. Uh, and I suppose we should just check: has anyone used MTurk or one of those online panels uh, that's here? And, and and obviously, you get people who are who are um, you know uh, from places in the world where. Um, the MTurk uh, um, reimbursement is actually a reasonable amount, a reasonable use for your time. So you can sit there and just tick, 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 and get the get the funds at the end. Um, but it doesn't sound like doesn't sound like anyone on the panel wants to comment on that one. It wasn't. I don't think it was fraud, but we used a recruitment company to recruit some young people for a survey and. Um, this recruitment company, obviously, once they do, similar, I think, to that, maybe the Amazon Turks, they got points for doing certain things. And then that, that equates to them getting some sort of payment from the company. And we could just tell that the quality of the responses wasn't as good as the ones that we actually got from social media. You can tell they probably just, you know, quickly went through the questions. And if there was an open text response, some of the questions weren't answered, um, I guess, in a, what would be a genuine response. It was just trying to get to the end. Um, so we did see a few of those, but um, I guess it's, that's the nature of the, um, the, the process. Um, and maybe, maybe we needed a higher sample size to sort of account for those sort of responses. But then again, it's a bit hard to tell if some weren't that genuine. So I guess we've got a question in the, in the Q and A about, uh, any differences that you see between studies that are more quantitative or more qualitative? Um, would anyone on the panel like to comment on that? Um, I can jump in on that. Uh, my my honours project was in quant was quantitative, oh, right. and it was a different population, so it wasn't healthcare; it was university students. But I definitely found having, I guess, a shorter time frame. So the 
the quantitative um, people were coming in for say half an hour as opposed to say 40 minutes to an hour for qualitative, which is more in depth. So I think with quantitative, the time is definitely a factor, like what you were just saying, um, Stephanie, about clicking through really quickly through questions. If people are doing yes or no, they're more likely to want to engage because it's a quicker time frame. Um, so in terms of when, when choosing what you're going to do, I guess it's, it does depend on your research question. But I think overall what I found is that in quantitative people, the students that I was, uh, I guess, asking to participate were more likely to engage because they knew it would be a shorter period of time and it didn't require them to think, I guess, as in depth, which could then relate to you were saying, Jacqueline, sorry, was saying earlier about um, whether you're passionate about something is really going to have an impact on how much you're willing to uh, provide and how much information you're willing to, um, I guess, sit and talk about for a long period of time. And this might lead into a bit of a discussion about barriers and enablers for, for online qualitative research. Anyone feel like they want to jump in on that? Uh, I guess within our group, we've done some qualitative work at the end of a digital health intervention to understand how people thought about um, what they thought about those programs. And I guess you're getting people like Robin who really enjoyed the program and had a positive experience. And they're the ones that, you know, are, are going to be participating in these sort of qualitative work. Obviously, yeah, they, they want to share what they, what they really enjoyed about the program. Um, but I guess then it's slightly skewed. You want to be able to, you know, capture data from people who potentially didn't have that good experience with the program as well, but that might not be through qualitative. It may be through, as Maddie was saying, a shorter uh, questionnaire um, where that they can quickly click through. I'm sorry, I've just minorly distracted. My, my dog ran away. <laughs> She's just come back. <laughs> um, uh, the benefits of online, <laughs> how, you can, how you can keep on with normal life while, while participating. Okay, so uh, we've got a question from Jaden. Can anyone share their experiences with successful messaging visuals on social media ad advertisements to grab the attention of participants and retain them through the onboarding process? Um, we're at the moment submitting uh, message uh, image banks to ethics committees. So because obviously we don't know what will grab young people, we work with them to develop the recruitment material, but we put in a suite of uh, ideas and a suite of different um, text-based options to recruit them. And we explain that that will be a, a mix and match process um, once we start to test it out online. Uh, we found that that's worked quite well because it gives us a lot of options and we don't have to go back to ethics each time with an update of the, you know, traditional recruitment poster, but it gives us a lot of different um, uh, options for recruitment. So that's been working quite well for our team at the moment. And again, yeah. that sounds like the deeper engagement with the, with the target group that you want to yeah, I just was going to add, I think that sounds like a, a great idea because I get quite tired of using my same recruitment advertisement for months and months and months. And I'm sure, you know, it, it starts, um, particularly when you're using it on Twitter to, with the same group of people, it starts to lose its impact. So, yeah, I, I've taken that idea on board and we may well use that in the future. Um, I guess in general, in terms of recruitment advertisements and using social media, something with a picture always stands out more than just text. So using some of those free stock photo sites like um, we use Unsplash or Pixabay or there's others out there to kind of have a photo on your recruitment advertisement tends to I think get more eyeballs and more engagement than just having text. And platforms like Can Canvas, um, you can create the exact size that you need for the certain um, social media platforms. So if it's Instagram, you get that perfect square or if it's Twitter you get the nice banner and it's exact size and whatever pixels things that you need so those kind of and they have free um, subscriptions as well so they're really good to use as well so could we go on to the next question um, Desiree asks how do you record participant consent 
do you end up having to email post consent forms back that you receive back? Alternatively, an online form better and does ethics approve of this type of consenting process? Uh, I was going to say that I, because of COVID, um, I recruited mainly by email and that meant that uh, I had to get people to sign consent forms and then they would essentially email them back to me. So they'd print them, sign them and then email them back to me, which I found to be actually quite good for record keeping as well, because then you can have, um, you have them all in the same spot. You're not, you know, getting mail um, or paper and having to then decide where you're going to keep it. So um, I'm not sure. I think it depends on the ethics committee, whether you can or can't do that. But I guess given the circumstances of what uh, we were all experiencing the past year, I think that they were a little bit more open to the idea that uh, consent could be via email or via, I guess, if you're talking on Zoom, you could get consent that way too. So, yeah. Uh, platforms like REDCap also offer um, e-consent, so you can um, the PDF of the actual consent form will come up on there and a participant can digitally sign it with their mouse and then it will save that PDF into the participant's file so you have an e-copy of the PDF as well. So REDCap, um, and it's quite straightforward, they've got videos about how to actually put that e-consent into REDCap uh, and it's quite straightforward. Uh, but again, as Maddie said, it's making sure that your ethics committee is um, is happy with that because some still are not happy with that kind of process, but it's just um, understanding what their requirements are. Brilliant. And, and I guess, uh, you know, platforms like REDCap are often quite well supported by ethics committees um, because they do allow the, the management of data access, for example. Yeah. Um, okay, there's another question in the Q&A. It's actually directed to you, Stephanie, but I, let's ask, let's throw it open to anyone who wants to answer it. Would anyone like to comment on the experience of using recruitment companies? Is it, more, is it a, a cost-effective approach and uh, comparison, say, against um, a social media? And I guess by social media, they mean a more organic, um, uh, uh, serendipitous social media strategy. Okay, I can start it if you like. So we used a company that um, uh, we were talking, looking for young people, but young people are not able to join these companies themselves. So we had to go through parents. So we had to target parents of, with teenagers. So that was listed on their profiles. And we actually sent out, it went out to 13,000 parents with young people. And we still only got 153 young people to fill out their online survey so it ended up costing us I think around nine dollars a person um, which was similar to the cost that we paid we did half social media and um, that was a similar price but I guess um, I find on social media I'm not a marketing expert and I'm not a um, that you know expert in that way so trying to navigate the the Instagram um, advertising platform is still quite confusing it and I, am I targeting the right things um, you can call and get help from those platforms as well but then it wasn't, I didn't find it that helpful. Um, so yeah, I do find them quite helpful, but I think it's all comes down to what are you asking for people to do? So if you just ask them to do an online survey, um, a recruitment company might be good, but if you're asking them to join a, you know, randomized control trial, you may not get those really keen people um, because these people in companies are often getting points to be able to doing surveys. So you've got to sort of weigh up what you're asking them to do. But it'd be interesting to see if anyone else has any other experience as well. Maybe, maybe Robin, from your perspective, how likely are you to do more market research style things that might target you if you say have a Facebook account or? Um... I certainly would. If it's face, Facebook's probably the only social media that I'm actually on. Um, I'm, as I said, I'm getting older, so I'm not quite au fait with um, things like Instagram and Twitter and those sorts of things. So Facebook is the only thing. Um, but certainly, I. I there are things on um, on Facebook that I quite often um, go into and acknowledge. As, and if there was any sort of research required uh, that particularly interested me, I'd certainly access that through Facebook. Um, so, so I'm I'm open 
I'm certainly open to social media. I'm just not au okay with a whole heap of different platforms other than Facebook. So um, I'm just thinking back to the cert, the um, study that I did for the um, knee osteo, knee and the, osteo, the knee pain management through Sydney Uni. Um, as I said, I, I picked it up through just, it was just a small, probably five or six line looking for people who wanted to volunteer. And I, then I got a, I did get a questionnaire to see whether I fit, fitted into the study and the consent form was um, through REDCAP. And that was, I think that was back in two, I think I did that study back in 2019, but they do keep, um, they keep in contact with me every 12 months to follow up and see how I'm going, which is really good. Okay, so uh, I, this, perhaps the next we could go on to is just talking about are there, how do we get to subgroups? And I guess the question that Dennis has is around people who are in regional areas as compared to major cities. Has anyone got any thoughts about that or, or how to get to any other um, um, sec, uh, sectors or subgroups in the, in the community? Um, so I think sort of going back to um, sort of what's worked best for us with our research, it has been sort of partnering with brain injury services. So we have, uh, I guess, made decisions to specifically work with, uh, for example, regional brain injury services based in Tamworth um, alongside some of the Sydney brain injury services so that we are getting a little bit more diversity in terms of the participants that we're recruiting. Um, but I guess on the other hand, that was one of the surprises for us um, in terms of making the move to digital health research. We thought that it would be easier to recruit because you can participate in any area of Australia. Um, but we still have found out a challenge, I think, that even though our studies are open to anyone in Australia, most of our participants do still come from Sydney. Um, I guess that's because where our networks are and where we know people. So I think, yeah, we still have some work to do in terms of how to tap into that um, broader, I guess, population of people with brain injury um, across Australia. I'd be really interested to know um, where uh, it's, it seems like where there are particularly marginalised or um, stigmatised groups uh, in the community, they often seem to find a kind of fairly tight social media kind of home uh, for mutual support. And I, and I wonder if anyone has an experience of being able to sort of engage with one of those communities um, and, and build a sort of trust and then access. I guess not maybe as specific as you're, as you're um, um, referring to Andrew, but I know we've recruited from um, mothers groups on Facebook. So these are huge groups of, of people with, you know, 20,000 or 30,000 members um, where you can specifically target um, your advertisee. And um, sometimes you might have to pay them a little bit, or sometimes if some people know the admin, you have to get through them and go that way. But one of the things that we did for one of our studies was just searching through to find groups that would be specific um, to what we were looking for. So you could potentially look for these groups that are available uh, and then you know what I mean, work to build a relationship with them or ask them what they, you know, do they advertise to their group or what is their uh, rules around that? Uh, and so you can sort of search for a lot of those things and start conversations with people on social media and ask if that's an, op uh, you know, if that's a pathway for recruitment. And I suppose one of the things that I, I've sort of kept an eye on. I'm not, I'm not really sure if I'm completely up to date with it, but some of the, the takes on the role of Cambridge Analytica and the, the election in which that orange man on Twitter achieved something. Um, uh, the, the possibility that if uh, online profiling was so effective that it could displace a candidate who is as credible as Hillary Clinton <laughs> It seems to me that we perhaps need to up our game in how sophisticated we are. Um, I don't really know how we do that. Uh, and I, I think we've got some clever digital health brains here who may have some take on that.
I actually had a conversation with a um, company that is an expert in these um, kind of um, recruitment and, you know, actually really understands those, how to target people really well and, you know, doing, they mentioned to me, I couldn't afford their services at the time. Um, but that's another thing because they are, can be quite expensive to recruit, but they really understand, you know, creating like, I think they called it micro advertising for specific groups. And then you do like for your study, you do six micro advertising and then you balance that out to recruit the, the right gender or the right um uh, um, from regional or rural locations or yeah you can do all those kind of things but it's guess that level of expertise that I don't have as the researcher um, but then it's now you know should I be budgeting all that into my grant applications and you know but a lot of the work that I do it's pilot work without funding so how then do I try to learn to do that myself anyway so yeah there's so many challenges I think in this space still but it's learning as we go. I guess the good thing about this digital health ECR community is you're not alone. Uh, I think there's one other question. I got minorly distracted because I found a nice citation, which I'm going to share with you in a minute. Uh, I just got slightly distracted from the Q&A. Um, there's one other question there. Uh, the effectiveness of something like, evaluating the effectiveness of something like Facebook advertising, what sorts of things into taking into consideration? There may be so many variables that come into play. Graphics, text, um, location, etc. Any anyone want to comment on that? Um, just as a just commenting as a not as a health professional, just as a consumer. But if I was looking, or if, if I was browsing the internet or Facebook or whatever, and there was um, some advertising for. A, a recruitment for a, a project I think the less wordy it is the more likely I am to investigate further just as a consumer because I think if it looks really wordy it must be hard so do I really want to spend that time so simple language an interesting language but kept short I think I that would interest me or grab my attention more than you know a great big spiel about a project So one question that I want to put in the heads of some of the panelists, they don't have to answer it straight away, but I might come back to that. And that really is from what you know now, what do you wish you would have known when you started your last study? What, what would be the kind of, what would you, what would be the message you'd give to your younger self about how to do digital health recruitment? So I'll, I'll come back to you on that one. Hold that one. <laughs> And just uh, checking these. One other questions come through in the Q and A. Um, oh no, we've already answered that one. Oops. If anyone feels like they're ready to take that big one on, <laughs> what would you what would you tell your younger self about about uh, digital health recruit recruitment in the digital space into our health into health research? Um, I guess I'll start. I was going to say that I think um, what I would tell myself, and I actually do tell myself this even now, is that your, I guess, our research is valuable and that asking, continuing to ask people to participate, whether that's once or twice or following up with people or um, I guess building rapport and trying to really build relationships is not, is really valuable. And I think that what I thought when I started out was that it was going to be as simple as asking someone to do something and then they'll say yes or no and then you move along um, initially. But what I know now is that it's actually really valuable to spend the time explaining what the study is to people or, or someone mentioned earlier, explaining what the benefit of the study is going to be and then um, following up with, you know, if they've gotten busy and they haven't responded, even though they said they were interested, making sure you're checking in if they'd still be interested or asking if they know anyone else that would be interested or has a, has an, a passion for this area or whatever it might be. So I think that something that I've definitely learned is that it's not just a matter of asking and then being like, that's the end of it. You have to really build those relationships. And in our, in a hospital setting that involves, you know, really getting a range of people on your side um, 
to understand the importance of what you're doing. I, I like that, Maddie. Thank you. That 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 relationship you have with your target group um, can be enhanced in a, through the digital platforms that we use. Anyone else want to jump in with uh, their message to their younger self? I think my goal is just to make the recruitment process and onboarding process as smooth as possible for participants. Because I'm noticing as soon as you switch to, you know, they do the expression of interest, then it's a phone call, then they have to go back and do the consent form. You're losing people when you make them jump from multiple different platforms. So trying to make that as smooth as possible. And I guess from a research perspective, understanding, you know, do I need that 20 20 question survey completed and how valuable is that data um, and do you know I really want it because I I'm you know need that data to be able to answer that question but can I get it in a shorter question it may not be you know as validated as that other question but it's going to save them time and I'm going to be able to recruit more people so really sort of weighing up those variables that are able to collect and you know do I need them to come in or can I get that online um, yeah and so just really trying to understand all of those uh, aspects of the study as well. Rachel, are you, are you feel ready to give a give an answer there, or shall I sure, yeah, yeah. give you a bit more time to think about it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I really do relate to to Maddie's point um, around investing the time in the relationships and in um, in the rapport building, in the follow up, and it, it can feel like it takes a lot of time and perhaps more time than what you'd expect to to do that initial contact and the follow up and following up with people again. Um, so I think if you compare that with if yeah, you can put that alongside that um, having that um, sense of the value of your research. I think that can really help you um, kind of maintain that motivation as a researcher to keep going and to, to follow up those relationships with people. And I suppose my other piece of advice is when recruitment is slow, to not panic, to, to stick, stick with it, but also to maybe think of, um, to, to talk with your research team and, and think of, okay, what is the plan B? We, we've got this project, we've got a time period to do it in and what happens if we don't get there? How can we use this data in a different way? And I, I think that can help you as well um, manage some of the, the stress of that recruitment period as well. Brilliant, thank you. We've got a question in the Q&A um, about... Um, uh, does anyone on the panel have experience with recruiting participants from culturally and ling linguistically diverse backgrounds? Um, so, so far with our research, we have had um, sort of speaking English at a level that doesn't require an interpreter as one of our inclusion criteria, but it's certainly something that we're interested in, um, you know, we're interested in promoting more inclusion of people um, from and linguistically diverse backgrounds in our research in the future. So, um, yeah, be interested to hear if others have thoughts on that. It sounds like that's a question we can have offline uh, and keep on going with it. Not, not, not one we've got an answer for today. Um, maybe Robin and Jackie, uh, we've just been talking about the importance of relationship. And I suppose what would bring you back? What would, what would bring you back to the next study? Um, what, what's, what, what sort of value uh, would you see in coming back to do another study with somebody? Well, I guess, I guess the, problem that I had um, when I started the study, I don't actually have anymore because I, I still have access to the physio app with all the exercises on. So whenever I start to feel that I'm getting a little bit achy and whatever, then I go through and do those, um, those uh, exercises again. Um, but definitely if there was, if, if there was an extension to what I'd been doing and Antonio rang and said, look, you know, we'd like to, to participate, then I would because um, Maddie's comments about it, investing time and building the rapport is something that I still feel that I have with Antonio who did the study with me because he does still 
um, keep in touch with me to see how I'm going, which, you know, I think is pretty important. So, so the answer is yes, I would, I'd participate. I'm not sure whether I'd be much help anymore because although I still have little niggles, they're not the same as they were. They're not as debilitating as they were, were when I started the study back in 2019. But here we are in 2021 and I'm participating in a research on um, participating digitally. So I'm still helping out somewhere along the line and I'm more than happy to continue doing any of that. That's brilliant. Thank you, Robin. Jackie, any thoughts about what would bring you back for a second study? Yeah, I think similarly to Robin and like we said before, if you, oh, can you hear me? Sorry. If yes. You, if, if you've participated in a study, um, obviously, because it is one of interest, and if you get that feedback, and, and part of the report, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a regular phone call with the, the researcher, but just to let you know, let them know how they how the study is going, and certainly if it's a, a positive outcome, um, that can make you personally feel good about participating in a study. So you definitely um, would think about participating in future studies, whether it's with this person or with another. I think if it's an if the process is easy, because as a as a say if you were a a consumer that's not really familiar with research, when everybody he hears the term research, they think of, oh gosh, it's really complicated. Um, you know, I've never done it before. I don't know what's involved. But if it's easy, if the process seems easy to the, the person participating, then you're more likely to go, yeah, I can do that. I've done it before. It was great. Andrew, could I, it'd, it'd be interesting to add if, to see, because obviously in, risk, in health, we do a lot of clinical trials type research, and obviously Robin potentially was in a randomised control trial, maybe who received the intervention, but it'd be interesting to hear from people in the control group, whether they feel like their contribution was still as valuable as someone who actually got benefit from the program. I don't know if anyone's had any, anyway, just a thought um, to see what they potentially think about their participation if they didn't actually benefit um, personally from it. I think that's an interesting one where there's, where there's a clinical trial with real clinical equipose, you know, the chance that the person will benefit is still there. So uh, we, we, it's, it's often hard running those sort of studies to keep reminding everybody that actually the reason we're doing this trial is we don't know the answer to that question. So, <laughs> but absolutely. Um, now I guess we've got another couple of minutes and we've got a couple of questions coming through. Um, Let's just have a stab at those and then maybe we can think about wrapping up. Um, okay, so there's a question about, will the power analysis be any different? Will, it, will there be a difference in deciding the number of participants when we do a Facebook questionnaire approach? How do you decide on the power of the study? Anyone got any, any comments there? Um, so I'm, I'm not sure that I can comment in, in, in an informed way, um, given we haven't really taken the, the Facebook advertising approach, but I would imagine um, in terms of deciding sample size and power, it would be the same if it's a Facebook uh, recruitment method versus a traditional recruitment method, but perhaps in the methods of your paper, you would need to explain sort of in detail how participants were recruited and perhaps it would be relevant to, well, I'd be interested what sort of the, the follow through rate was and perhaps that would be a relevant detail to include. I think that's particularly important. My sense of it is that reviewers need to learn <laughs> about the differences between getting people's eyeballs on a very brief, quick, as opposed to their health professional told them they should take part in the study and they refused. <laughs> I think there's a there's an education process to be done there. Okay, uh, and then Dennis has asked any comments on the recruitment outcomes facilitated by community participation and continuous engagement through the research process via re versus I, I suppose it's versus research institution driven efforts. So it's often it's an interesting thing about whether the credibility of the institution you work for versus your own out there engagement with the community. What do you think about that? I 
think sometimes it's good to have that backing of a known institution behind what you're doing so people are able to recognize that that brand and and it being um, I guess maybe a potentially positive um, brand in their eyes um, for us as well it's been going through um, known services for young people like headspace and those that young people recognize because it, I guess us coming through with a study that we've branded ourselves it's unrecognizable in the community um, so how do we get that out through recognized channels so I think it's definitely it's important to have some sort of recognition behind um, these our recruitment efforts And we're coming to the end of our time. So I, I just wonder, we've got some really interesting conversation that's gone on in the chat about, um, about um, um, using Google Translate, um, getting um, uh, cultural sensitivity there, that really interesting things to think about. But I think we're getting close to the end of our time. So maybe could I ask you just to um, contemplate what are the final kind of things you want to say uh, maybe i'll just jump in and say a few things because i think one of the what we've really what we've really done what everybody's done over the last 18 months two years is quite phenomenal we're already in a space where funding for uh, research is under pressure uh, we have faced um, significant challenges in the university environment with uh, the, the without receiving job keeper and the kind of um, insecurity around employment and then we've got the pandemic. So I think it's always a really important thing to say when we get together in an event like this, wow, you guys have kept on doing research through this pretty difficult time. Um, and I think everybody really deserves, uh, you know, to, to give each other a, a, a great round of applause in that space. Go, go everybody here for keeping on going during COVID is, is the sort of thing I wanna, I wanna really say. Um, having said that, I think what are the lessons that I take away from today? I would say it's about relationships. It's about getting the tech right. Um, it's about understanding what else the person could be doing with their time. Um, and uh, uh, I think that's it from me. But could I just ask each of you on the panel and maybe um, could we start with Maddie? Because I don't think you've spoken for a minute or two. What's, what's your final take home message? Um, I, I would just echo exactly what you said. And I think that putting a positive spin on it, I mean, for me, Zoom has been unbelievably helpful in my recruitment. I think that a lot of people that I spoke to, I wouldn't have had access to um, if I would have just gone and into a hospital environment and tried to recruit in that way. I think that um, being, I guess, grateful for the fact that we do have these technologies, but then also knowing that, for example, what Robin said earlier about being aware of the target audience. And some people might not be comfortable um, doing an interview over Zoom. They might not know how to use Zoom and that's completely fine. And I think being able to tailor your method to what the people you're trying to access is now what I've learned. So going forward, if I was to do research, I'd probably offer both. I'd say, you know, I can come and whenever suits you or, you know, we can do it at a time and place even in your own home via Zoom. And yeah, that's something that this period has really emphasized to me, the importance of, of that well-rounded approach to research. Thanks, Maddie. Um, Robin, any final recommendations or comments for us? I, I think both you and Maddie have summed up exactly what I was thinking. The, um, I think the, these um, researchers are doing an amazing job in the pandemic. And I think that shows how important probably it is to be able to, to do um, a lot of the programs digitally, because when you can't, we, when you can't meet people face to face, it's, 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 a, it's an avenue to be able to continue on um, with, with what the community needs. So, and Maddie, Maddie summed up before about investing time and building the relationships and, and took up my comment about um, the importance of um, the target audience that not everyone's digitally uh, competent, but uh, it's in this day and age, we probably all need to be. So, yeah, and I think you and Maddie both summed up exactly what I was planning on saying. So thank you. And thank you for having me. Thank you for being here, Robin. <laughs> and, and Stephanie or Rachel, could I get maybe one of you, because we've got out of time. Go, Rachel, you go. Um, well, 
I just would want to echo um, similarly the reflections um, of, of Andrew and Maddie and Robin um, in terms of um, really keeping the participant um, at the heart of, of um, the process. And I guess if I were to add one more point to that, um, just echoing my point about considering the communication accessibility of the information you're putting out there, because that really would facilitate involvement of perhaps people with communication disability in your research. But often some of those adaptations like Easy English make it easier for anyone to participate in your research. And that can um, encompass culturally and linguistically diverse um, participants as well. So it's always good to keep that um, in your mind when you're developing your recruitment materials. Absolutely, Rachel. Fantastic. Um, I think that's sort of almost at, at, at the end of our time. I, I really wanted to say thank you to the panelists for bringing their expertise today, uh, and for being a, and being generous and sharing with with us. Uh, I really want to say thank you also to Anna and Milan and Lillian and the others who are pulling together the Digital Health ECI network. 